afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the June monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, which is in collaboration with the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. Today's theme is COVID-19, home-based care and long COVID, which is very topical. And uh, we have with us Dr. Ruiz Hanifa, a well-known national and international figure and a family physician who is also the head of the Department of Family Medicine of the University of Colombo. We also have Dr. Dineshani Hetiarachi, who is a senior lecturer and family physician from the Department of Anatomy, Genetics and Biomedical Informatics of the University of Colombo. And Dr. Sunit Rajavasan, a council member of the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. He is also the CEO of the Family Clinic Private Limited. So, first of all, let me invite Dr. Ruiz Hanifa to make his uh, presentation and to start the ball rolling. Over to you, Ruiz. Uh, thank you very much, Ishan, for those very kind words of introduction of me and my team. Uh, from the College of General Practitioners, we are extremely thankful to the SLMA for inviting us to participate in this month's uh, monthly clinical meeting. And uh, me, along with my team, which you have so kindly introduced, uh, will be taking you through a few slides to tell you about the home-based care of COVID-19. As uh, Professor Ishan Soisa mentioned, COVID is topical because we are not out of the pandemic as yet. Therefore, and I, uh, if you are following the literature at the moment, there seems to be a surge again of Omicron uh, with a sublineage B4, BA4 and BA5, which is supposed to be the most transmissible subvariant of Omicron yet identified with the added problem of it being immune, invas uh, immune evasive. So these things may crop up. So we thought it is timely that we talk to you about this subject. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let me uh, proceed with our presentation. We will be taking you through the virology, very basically immunology and epidemiology of COVID, the coronavirus, just for refreshment of memory purposes. Then giving you a case-based scenarios, one of course a hospital-based one, because we must not forget COVID can become bad at any time. And then we'll be coming into our home territory of home-based care, which GPs do. Then I will be sharing a unique experience uh, of telemedicine done by one of our innovative general practitioners, Dr. Sunit, along with Dr. Asanka, who will take you through some data about their experience of telemedicine. A word about long COVID, I don't think is out of place in this today's COVID scenario. And we conclude with Dr. Um, Badesh, uh, Dr. Hityarachu doing a few MCQs. So just to go back to the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start after all, the beginning. So we all know about the SARS-CoV-2, uh, which became an issue, uh, it was called the novel coronavirus 2019, went through a few metamorphoses in terms of its name. And now we have settled on, uh, uh, we have called it the COVID-19 virus, and it causes COVID-19, the disease. So this is the, you can see the picture of the virus. It's a coronavirus. We'll tell you in a minute. So this is just the family tree of COVID. I, the, I don't want you to take you through the details. I just want to point out that this is a beta coronavirus as opposed to the alpha coronavirus. Why I'm saying that is we are having a bit of an outbreak of influenza A and so on these days. So as GPs, we are seeing a lot of this. And I'm sure... Uh, those of you who are listening who are in practicing medicine are also having the same issue of differentiating and we will come to the tests there are diagnostic tools which we can differentiate between these two uh, the structure of the coronavirus is of importance in identifying its immunology and later talking about long covid this becomes a little relevant 
So I thought I'll show you the structure with a particular emphasis on uh, the spike protein and the envelope protein. Another point I want to make is about this hand washing, which we seem to be forgetting as doctors even these days. We are not um, using sanitizers. We are becoming a bit immune to this. But please remember that due to this lipid bilayer of the coronavirus, it is extremely susceptible to soap and water. So that is a very important preventive strategy one ought to be using in this uh, scenario, especially among GPs and even, uh, I think, hospital-based doctors. We thought we'd show you about the genome with a particular reference to this, uh, uh, its immunogenicity about the spike protein, the membrane protein, the nucleoside protein, and so on, because um, these become important when you talk about the diagnostics, they talk about various cutoff values and so on, and about the vaccines, how they act. So it will be quite a good idea to have uh, some knowledge about this thing, out, out of which, of course, as I have bolded, the spike protein is the key guy because the virus uses this to bind to mainly the respiratory uh, cells in the respiratory system, but not exclusively there. If you are interested, you may watch two interesting uh, uh, videos which I have given the link to, which shows the how this virus replicates, and you can have a detailed knowledge about this, and it's quite a visual understanding of how the virus replicates. Uh, about the metamorphosis of COVID, yes, we have gone through alpha, beta, gamma, delta, now we're in Omicron, and Omicron is having several sublineages, uh, and uh, this is how the names have evolved, and we hope this evolution stops sooner than later. The transmission is very, very important in advising our patients and protecting ourselves as well. It's mainly by droplet bone infection. Short-range airborne routes are also have been documented. A long-range airborne route by aerosol within closed environments have also been demonstrated. Uh, droplet infect uh, formite routes, again, with very close contact, within hospital settings and in our general practices have been reported. So these are the way the virus tends to spread. Transmissibility, I am putting this slide uh, just to talk to you about the R0 traits and so on. If you are reviewing any epidemiological report which the Epidemic uh, puts out, they have a wonderful website. I think you should be visiting it. Uh, or if you are looking at international data, they talk to you about these R rates because they are very important in our practices because, say, for example, the epidemic says the R rate today is 1.5 or whatever. Then you know that the cases are going to hit in about two weeks uh, or a little more, uh, maybe one or two incubation period time. So that may be between 14 to 28 days, you are going to see a surge. So as general practitioners, we can get ready for these things of preparing our staff, our um, the practices, and so on. So it's important to have an idea about the R0 rate. Symptoms, I will quickly go through fever, cough, fatigue, so throat, shortness of breath, as if, as if with any infective disorder. Uh, and uh, But it has, when you go into little details, week one, week two, week three, start breaking up a bit. So as GPs, we mainly see people in week one and probably after discharge from hospital on week three. The hospital symptoms are uh, dealt with our colleagues in the hospital. So this is where the undifferentiated patient, your skill in dealing with the undifferentiated patient comes to the fore because you don't know what the infection is. So you need to be highly vigilant and use all your toolkits to try to establish this diagnosis, which is made much more easier now than during the early COVID days. So fever uh, universally has to be there. It may be intermittent or persistent with fatigue and malice. Again, half the patients will have this. Dry cough is a feature, uh, but it was mainly seen in the Delta variant and the Alpha variant. With Omicron, it's not that prominent. Dyspnea was also very uh, of the Delta variants. Less common symptoms are given there. So hospital-based symptoms are, of course, um, hospital where you will have a frank pneumonia or any other complication. Uh, as GPs, it is uh, um, good 
to know that after discharge from hospital, these patients are going to come to see you. So that therefore we'll talk about uh, long COVID uh, a little later uh, uh, and we'll get there. Uh, actually, this is my most important slide, which I want to show you. This data was done with the original coronavirus the alpha variant and then delta, uh, even with Omicron. So as you can see, even with the highly, uh, the mortality, which is very high with the delta variant, 80% of the patients were asymptomatic or mild. In other words, they will not require hospital admission. So this is a point to remember. This is where home-based management becomes very, very important and critical. 15, uh, let me say 20% will show symptoms. Out of the 20%, 15% will be symptomatic, but will not require hospital admission, but will require closed monitoring. This is where Sri Lanka developed the intermediate care centers where we ought to be treating the symptomatic patients, not the asymptomatic ones. Hospitalization, yes, there are specific criteria. My colleague, Dr. Dineshani, will be talking to you about in a minute. Um, of course, it goes beyond us, but we can coordinate the care. So as a GP, you must have a list of what are the intermediate care centers in your area, how to access them, be it government, be it private, uh, if it's private, what are the rates? You need to keep your patients informed uh, because uh, if it's a pain thing, it might be a bit of a shock uh, on top of the illness itself to be able to afford these cares. So please do go to the MOH site, uh, be in touch with your local MOH and ask him or her about the ICC care facilities available for you to facilitate for our patients. And of course, from there, the admission will be looked after by them. If it's a private sector, please be aware of where and how and when you can uh, uh, contact these people. Uh, the most common studies done are WBC, uh, CRP, D dimers a little later on. Uh, liver functions, we advise you to do and keep as a baseline study. Uh, and of course, the creatinine. Chest x is has a positivity of a sensitivity of 59%, not usually done. CTs are the gold standard, but they will require once you go into hospital, echo depending on the symptoms. Uh, the testings are, of course, the PCR and the rapid antigen test. As you can see, the PCR is 6 to 80% sensitive. Rapid antigen tests are good with a 92 probability of having, if you have symptoms, um, the chances are. Uh, very high that you will detect. A uh, small caveat here, the government currently recommends not to use rapid antigen test as a screening tool. So this is the overview of the EPID part of it. We had three waves from March, the first wave was from March to October 2020. Second wave is October to April. Um, that was the out of the cluster. And then of course the third wave, uh, which was not so bad, which was basically at the end, by about end of uh, uh, November, December, we switched from Delta to Omicron, uh, which was uh, less severe. So this is the current uh, record. We checked the site this morning. It has been updated up to the 16th of June. Sri Lanka had a total of uh, 663,972 confirmed cases of COVID with 16,519 deaths. Uh, and the vast majority, the vast majority have recovered because of this slide. 80% are asymptomatic. So therefore, GPs have a huge role to play in managing this. Uh, Dineshani, can I hand over to you now? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Slides from here for Yes, uh, so this is a case that required hospital-based management. Uh, the objective of doing this case is to show that even though 80% are mild and asymptomatic, there can be 20% that uh, become severely ill and about 5% uh, require hospital uh, admission as well. Uh, so this is a case of a 50-year-old bank manager who developed fever accompanied by a cough, sore throat, dizziness, and fatigue. And he also tested positive for COVID-19. He gave contact history uh, from a positive colleague. Uh, so he was managed at home for four days, but his symptoms worsened. Um, and uh, due to his clinical manifestations and epidemiological history, he was referred to the IDH hospital. Uh, the patient had also a history of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, which was uncontrolled. 
so on admission, his fever was uh, 38.4 degrees, his respiratory rate was 21 breaths per minute, and his heart rate was 116 beats per minute. His blood pressure was 129 by 88 millimeters Hg, and his oxygen saturation was 91% in ambulatory air. Uh, so amb ambient air. Then arterial blood gas analysis indicated that arterial oxygen tension was 66 milligrams per G and uh, oxygen index was uh, 43.8. And uh, his uh, oxygen saturation, even with oxygen, was about 91%. Right. So, and he was confirmed to have severe uh, COVID-19. His uh, chest imaging was also done and which showed bilateral opacities as well. Uh, so uh, another abnormal result was the C-reactive protein was highly elevated, 98, uh, 93 millimeter, milligrams per liter, and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, was also elevated. And uh, uh, then he was followed, uh, by, followed up by the uh, physicians in the hospital, and uh, the hospital-based management was followed, and his symptoms improved after the hospital-based management. Um, Yes, so then uh, the guidelines were, the followed guidelines were shown here. It, it is a provisional clinical practice guidelines on COVID-19 suspected and confirmed patients. This was uh, put out, I think, in March 2020. Uh, so this uh, is just to show that uh, we shouldn't miss any cases that might become severe. Uh, but we will now return to the uh, main aspect of this presentation, which is the home-based management. I think uh, Dr. Sunit Rajavasan and his colleague, Dr. Asoka, will uh, take us through another case, which uh, emphasizes the importance of home-based management. Thank you. Right, thank you, Asanka. Let me just take over. I'm Dr. Sunit, and uh, first and foremost, uh, please excuse me for my voice is really hoarse. I, I am running a temperature and having a sore throat myself, the irony of it all. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's not COVID myself. But uh, let me first uh, make a brief introduction. I am an entrepreneur in primary care. And I have run a company where we employed over 80 GPs to handle COVID home care since August of 2021 in partnership, in partnership with eChanneling. And through this, we have seen close to 2,000 patients. And um, Dr. Asanka was one of my star GPs who, who worked with us. And she herself has seen close to 140, 150 patients by herself. And she has compiled all the data that she has seen. And uh, she presented a cohort study uh, based on that data. And without further ado, I will actually give the floor over to Dr. Asanka to uh, uh, go for, to, to uh, speak further on her case scenario as well as to present her data. Thank you. Uh, Asanka? Thank you, Dr. Sunit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, here, uh, I first of all, I will just briefly go through a home-based uh, managed case. It was a 24-year-old girl with bronchial asthma, was not on regular treatment or on inhalers, and with no any significant medical history, was diagnosed with COVID-19 on 24th of January 2022. She was complaining of cough, fever, and nasal blockage. She was prescribed with vitamin C, Syncovit, vitamin D, Phenicoff, Syrup, and Provita N nasal drops and Sinet. The symptoms responded except for the dry cough, even though she was suffering from continuous cough, her saturation was maintained at 97 to 99 at rest as well as after exercise. As her dry cough was worsened at night and early morning, she was prescribed Astelene NDI SOS. After continuous 14 days monitoring, she was complaining of dry cough. She and uh, I thought of referring her to a chest physician and ask her to take a chest, um, a chest x ray. She was seen by the chest physician and informed that the chest x ray was normal. And since she was having a very <clears throat> a history of wheezing, he had prescribed for a coat inhaler as well. After several days of continuous use of both the inhalers, her symptoms has improved. Next slide. Hold on, so next. Yeah, hold on a second. Uh, sorry, one second. There you go. Uh, this is the guidelines uh, issued by the Ministry of Health regarding the uh, care selection for home management. And uh, the CGPSL, in the next slide, uh, CGP. SL has also issued a uh, book regarding home-based care. And next slide. <clears throat> this was my study and uh, 
a retrospective analysis of the symptom course in the telemedicine monitoring clinic for acute symptomatic COVID-19. Next slide. COVID-19 has brought large numbers of patients to medical attention within a span of months for care of a previously undescribed illness. Early reports on the presentation and natural history of COVID-19 appropriately focused attention on the severe cases and critically ill ones. Subsequent surveillance has demonstrated that the majority of patients have milder forms of illness. It is recommended that they remain at home with medical supervision. Next slide. <clears throat> In August 2021, we established a virtual clinic through the family clinic for the care of patients in home isolation with COVID-19. All patients were assessed by me with regards to COVID-19 symptoms using a standardized clinical note, which includes past medical history, drug history, and allergic history. Patients were followed for symptom management with regular telephone calls twice daily by myself until improvement or hospitalization. The current study is based only on the patients seen by me on both platforms, Family Clinic and ORDOC, to analyze the complete symptom reporting for the study cohort. Next uh, slide. <clears throat> of my objective was to describe the disease history in a history of COVID-19 patients and assess characteristics that predict symptom duration. Conducted a retrospective study of the patients who are followed up through the telemedicine clinics, that is the family clinic and ODOC. Next slide. The study was a retrospective cohort study conducted at the family clinic and ODOC online platforms. It was 141 patients with COVID-19 from 26th of August, 2021 to 17th of April, 2022 followed up for either 14 days period or seven days period based on existing knowledge for assessment and treatment guidelines. The diagnosis of COVID-19 was done by nasopharyngeal PCR and the patients requested a home isolation were included. Patients were monitored through audio consultations twice daily for consecutive 14 days or seven days later on. Next slide. <clears throat> I have categorized the symptoms according to mild, moderate, and severe. Mild symptoms were again categorized under respiratory and systemic symptoms. Respiratory were cough symptom production, sputum production. Systemic symptoms were fever, chills, malaise, myalgia, anorexia, diarrhea, vomiting, and headache. Moderate symptoms were respiratory, severe cough, dyspnea on exertion, wheezing, or sensation of mild chest tightness. Severe symptoms were with resting dyspnea, labored breathing, resting pulse oximetry, less or equal to 92%, pleuritic pain, and hemoptysis. Systemic symptoms were acute confusion, severe weakness, syncope, uh, acute decline in functional status. Next slide. Documentation of specific COVID-19 symptoms, including onset and offset dates patient reported date and symptom severity. Documentation of specific medical conditions associated with risk of severe COVID-19. Demographic data such as age, gender, and address all were documented. Next slide. Uh, according to the uh, categorization, I have categorized upper respiratory systemic, lower respiratory, and gastrointestinal symptoms. The upper respiratory uh, symptoms were cough, congestion, sore throat, loss of smell or test. Uh, systemic were fever, body aches, chills, dizziness, headache, and joint pain. Lower respiratory symptoms were shortness of breath with exertion, shortness of breath at rest, chest tightness, and wheezing and gastrointestinal symptoms were nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. <clears throat> Next slide. Results showed that the total number of cases were 141, and ages were ranging from 1.5 years to 78 years, with a mean age of 42 years. And total 100, 100, there were 142 coma. total number of cases were there, but I have excluded one patient who was uh, hospitalized. Next slide. According to the gender distribution, it was 54% was uh, males and 46% uh, were females. Next slide. 
age distribution showed that 16% were less than 25 years of age, 6% were between 35 to 35, and 47% were between 36 to 45, and 8% were between 46 to 55, and lastly, 23% were more than 55 years of age. Next slide. Mean number of days from symptom onset to carry out PCR or RAT was two days. Follow up was done twice daily for two weeks initially and then twice daily for one week in the latter part, according to the government quarantine rules. Only two patients had severe symptoms and were hospitalized. The two patients were suffering from chronic asthma. Next slide. Comorbidities of these uh, 141 patients were uh, 12 patients were more than 60 years of age, two patients were chain smokers, 21 was with diagnosed uh, of uh, asthma, one patient was with liver, pal uh, liver failure awaiting uh, liver transplant, two patients were confirmed pregnant ones, five was with diabetes, seven hypertensive patients, and one is with COVID obesity. Next slide. Uh, the symptom analysis showed that 87.2 uh, was uh, with uh, suffering from fever, 53% was with chills, 64% with body aches, and 37% was complaining of headache, 41% loss of smell or taste, and 44% nasal congestion, 56% were, were complaining of sore throat, and uh, there are some minor symptoms as well, such as cough, chest tightness, esophagitis, rest, wheezing, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and, uh, and rashes. Next slide. The patients present with upper respiratory tract symptoms during day one and followed by lower respiratory symptoms during day three to four and gastrointestinal symptoms during four to five days. The commonest complaint was cough with sputum, which is 61.7%, and it lasted for a longer duration than expected, around 21 days. The commonest symptom, which was unresolved at the final audio consultation, was cough with sputum, that is 29.78%, mostly among known patients with asthma, which is 10.6%, and loss of taste and smell were seen in about 10.6%. Overall, symptoms were reduced with the COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide. The conclusion of my study was coronavirus in patients presents more with constitutional systemic symptoms than lower respiratory tract symptoms. Initial symptom severity may predict the duration of the disease. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Asanka. Over to you, Dr. Revise. So, Nim. Right. Uh, till we switch over, yeah. So, the study was, we thought we'd show it to you because uh, there are a few, this was the, one of the documented cases. Uh, so, at this point, may I also remember, remind the audience that uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Association itself. Uh, started uh, the on call, this two doc 247 on call, uh, which also served the community all over the island in a huge way. So, we were able to convince the ministry to issue the circular to uh, offload the hospital system because at this time, I think you remember the hospitals were overwhelmed. So we were able to show the data saying that 80% of even the Delta variant did not require hospital admission, provided we provide a system of continuous monitoring, which was demonstrated by uh, Dr. Asanka and Sunit in a private capacity uh, and to the 247 service of the SLMA. Uh, and the Ministry of Health also had a home management service, which the SLMA once you screened and uh, handed over to them. So the COVID pandemic was uh, managed in a, by in a huge way through ambulatory care. So the message we wanted to give to the audience today is yes, uh, COVID is, uh, can be managed at home provided we stick to the guidelines, which Asanka has alluded to. I'm not showing you all the guidelines, 
but the Ministry of Health has issued this. And also, once you follow those guidelines, the CGPSL has put out a book. Um, it's in all three languages, which will take you step by step how to prepare your clinic, how to uh, your staff, the precautions you should take, the medications you should use. Uh, may I at this point remind the audience that there are some medications you should not use under any circumstances in home-based management. And we, this book re-emphasizes that through the health ministry guidelines. So the inappropriate use and prescriptions of medications is discouraged thoroughly. Uh, if you do have problems from a primary care perspective, please consult a chest physician or the hospital-based care. So this book, uh, again, may I remind the GPs in the audience, if you do not have a copy, it's downloadable from the college website. Uh, talks on very practical things about how you set up your clinic. What is the equipment needed? Uh, for example, the pulse oximeter becomes become sine qua non in monitoring these patients, as Asanka said, during her twice audio calls with the patients, these symptoms are monitored. Red flag signs to look out. The patients are quite clearly emphasized in this book. I'm not taking you through the book because that will take a long time to do. Uh, yeah. So just to remind you again about this slide, please do remember that most of the illnesses are mild, uh, as uh, Dr. Asank also had shared with us. So you need to classify them as mild, moderate, and severe. Moderate, mild diseases can be monitored. Moderate uh, diseases should, um, depending on the number of uh, calls you make, or the patient might call you unsolicited, please encourage them to call you. Critical disease, there's no problem. It has stayed go to the hospital. Right, back to our presentation. Just give us a minute. Right. Thank you, Harim. So, uh, as I think Dr. Asank also showed you, and the theory part I showed you before, the symptoms are quite uh, telling in the, even in our local samples. And I told you about the week one uh, symptoms, week two, three. Uh, basically, if you're not monitoring at hospital level, uh, she also has come up with the same figures. The age ranges doesn't span age, but uh, Right, and these were the same. Right, so let's get on with long COVID. Uh, the issue with long COVID is the WHO has still not have a very definitive diagnosis, uh, a definitive definition on long COVID as yet. So the gala is a problem which leads to a concern that a variety of conditions, <laughs> ranging from psychomotor to and dysfunctional to cardiac to be classified as long COVID. So a few, we went through a few of the literature and chose a few studies. And um, the consensus among the studies is that if any symptom persists for more than three months uh, and the patient has verifiable PCR positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2, then you can consider classifying it as long COVID. So uh, at the moment, still we are not too sure. We're still under a lot of study. 
So with some precaution, but as GPs, I'm sure you are seeing loads and loads of uh, patients who are either attributing multiple symptoms to COVID or in fact the vaccine will be coming to that in a moment. So long COVID is definitely an entity. Uh, the potential mechanisms which have been discussed are uh, immune dysregulation, autoimmunity problem, or viral persistence. Uh, according to the literature, the commonest symptoms of long COVID are fever, fatigue, brain fog, uh, and that one, these numbers here indicate the potential mechanism which may cause these signs and symptoms. So fever uh, persistence for uh, a lot, more than three months is concerning. Uh, so a lot of people get investigated for PUOs and so on. Uh, so there is a lot of doubt again, like I said in the definition. Fatigue, yes, I, we are seeing, I think, more than even three months, but this gets complicated with a whole lot of other issues. Uh, but they have attributed fatigue to the viral presence. A persistent uh, viral presence. Brain fog was identified very, very early on in the COVID as a symptom and then carried on to, uh, because it didn't resolve, it was put into the category of uh, long COVID. And again, we think that it's due to viral persistence that it's caused. Uh, neuropathy is just, again, uh, they think that it's in autoimmunity and uh, due to viral presence. Sleep problems, Loss of smell and taste, yes, these uh, are acute symptoms, which again persist. I think we have, we are seeing a lot of, uh, more than taste, it's the smell, uh, which is the problem. Uh, chest pain, uh, yes, it is due to, they say, I think it's autoimmunity. And um, we have had many cases of self-diagnosed Myocarditis people coming to us and saying, Doctor, I can't walk with the mask. When I walk with the mask, my I can't breathe, I have shortness of breath, I have chest pain, and so on. And we have referred them to a cardiologist and confirmed uh, some degree or variant of some type of a myocarditis going on. So that is again, even in Sri Lanka, we have documented such cases. Shortness of breath, this motility symptoms loss of appetite and difficulty in swallowing. So these are a selection of symptoms and the potential causes. We thought we are not going to, we are not going to present about the vaccines, the mechanisms of action and so on. But as GPs, we encounter a lot of problems like the long COVID coming to us saying, you know, these symptoms were triggered off after the vaccine. So we are placed in a very difficult position because we know that these vaccines are uh, useful in reducing the severity of diseases. We know they don't prevent the disease, but in terms of severity, hospital admission, and therefore um, outcomes in terms of mortality are considerably reduced due to the vaccines. But there is this huge myth in society all over the world, not only here, that the vaccines are not effective, they cause various problems, and so on. So the first thing, uh, as primary care physicians and GPs, I suppose any doctor, we need to re-emphasize that the vaccines are indeed safe, effective, and severe reactions due to vaccines are rare. This is going on the current evidence we have. In future, this might change, but the current evidence is that they are indeed safe and effective. And also, uh, we need to distinguish between side effects of the vaccine and adverse effects. Uh, so a bit of reassurance in terms of side effects uh, goes a long, long way to build confidence among patients and their families and their friends and extended families as well. Uh, you can motivate them by explaining side effects and adverse effects. So let me just deal with three very common questions asked by us. Thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome. There was a huge hue and cry related to the AstraZeneca vaccine and they on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. In Sri Lanka, it was the AstraZeneca which was causing this uh, huge problem uh, because people tend to believe what they want to believe, when they want to believe it, and how they want to believe it. So as GPs, we have a huge role 
in communicating the facts to the patients we see. So thrombosis and thrombocytopenia did occur with AstraZeneca vaccine, so we cannot deny it, but it was very, very, very rare. Guillain Barre syndrome, again, uh, with uh, mRNA vaccines, particularly with uh, uh, Johnson and Johnson, we didn't have a huge problem in Sri Lanka because we didn't use it much. Myocarditis and pericarditis, again, rare with vaccines, but was seen with the mRNA-based vaccines, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the Moderna. So now we are using Pfizer vaccine in Sri Lanka uh, for the third and fourth boosters, so uh, we may, because when you give a huge number of patients the vaccine, you may see a few cases. So GPs, please keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, if patients are complaining of uh, any cardiac symptoms, please do get them uh, investigated while reassuring them that uh, it is very, very rare. Uh, COVID vaccination and the impact on menstrual cycle, um, it was a big problem. In fact, personally, I also saw quite a number of cases. Uh, there was an article, the editorial, in fact, published in the BMJ this January, uh, which classified it as small and short-lived. Uh, well, that this, uh, if I can, Professor Ishan will permit me to uh, express a personal opinion. Now, this short and short, small and short-lived is not defined. The patients I am seeing are having it for quite some time. Uh, and I am at a loss to explain to them as to why this is, when will the uh, cycles come back. And the BMJ editorial uh, doesn't shed much light on it, quite uh, understandably, because they also must be still studying the data. But um, the consensus seems to be that the menstrual cycle problems appear to be short-lived. So those were the complications of the vaccines we thought we'll, uh, we will uh, just give you an overview about. Uh, now I think I hand over to Dr. Dineshani. Thank you, sir. I think the slides have gotten stuck at long COVID, sir. Okay, so I think uh, we can move on to the MCQs. So, so to go through the slide, uh, now th this is what I was telling you, uh, the vaccines are indeed safe and effective, CV reactions are rare. Please take the time and make the effort to explain between side effects which are known and will happen and adverse effects which may happen but which are rare. Uh, talk about the data about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the thrombocytopenia. Don't uh, say it's trivial or whatever. Confront it and say it's very, very rare, but it has happened. Gilan Bari, we did not see because we didn't use the Johnson & Johnson much in Sri Lanka. Myocarditis and pericarditis are issues with mRNA vaccines, particularly in young people. Uh, various theories that they are active and uh, so please pay attention to that. Uh, menstrual cycle problems after, again, the mRNA vaccines are causing a problem. Even the AstraZeneca has early reports. Uh, so please uh, do not uh, pay adequate attention to them. The current consensus as early, if I may say, as January 2020, was that it appears to be small and short-lived, but there is no clear uh, idea as to what short-lived is. Right. Uh, Arindu, can we move on? Right. Okay, Dineshani, I will go on to the MCQs now. Okay, sir. Uh, 
start moving. Okay, so, okay. so the first we have three MCQs lined up. Uh, first, these are true false type MCQ. Uh, which of the following is an indication for home based management of COVID 19 with mild symptoms? Children under two years of age, pregnant women, an individual on long term immunosuppressant therapy, a 59 year old woman without any comorbidities. A 45 year old man living alone with no family support. Yes, uh, so the true uh, answer is a 40, uh, 59 year old woman, woman with, uh, without any comorbidities. According to the guidelines, uh, anyone less than two years of age should be admitted and over 60 years should be admitted. And any pregnant woman should be See, should be referred to hospital-based management and any individual on long-term steroids should be uh, referred for hospital-based management. And uh, similarly, any comorbidities, BMI over 30, all these, any uh, red flags we have to refer to for hospital-based management. And in the last term, a 45-year-old uh, man living alone, if adequate self-care is not there, then definitely it has to be uh, yeah, for, uh, referred for hospital management if there is no family support or he can't look after himself. Yes, so this is uh, the guidelines based on the guidelines for home-based management of mild symptoms. We can move on uh, to the second MCQ. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, Dinesh, just quickly to add, uh, yeah. that is what before you undertake uh, the home-based care, like Asanka and Sunit was saying, you must document these things and be in touch with the local MOH. Uh, ideally, uh, in the initial stages, this did not happen. Uh, you are supposed to send a social care worker from the MOH, that was a social care team, to go and assess the, the family support and the area and so on. Because uh, in Colombo, uh, these flats and all had a huge problem uh, because we they thought that we might spread the virus more. Uh, so Dineshan is quite right. If there is no family support, uh, it is you are well within your rights to be admitting this patient to an ICC facility. Uh, depending uh, on that, they will take over from there. So the, the, the community part assessment also needs to be done. That, that's why we work with our preventive sector colleagues. All right, let's move on. The second MCQ, which of the following is an indication for referral of a patient for hospital management? Mild difficulty in breathing, an SpO2 of 97 on mild exertion, a red flag identified by the GP during the remote assessment. Patients suddenly becoming confused. And asthma experienced by the patient. So uh, the correct answers are mild difficulty in breathing, a red flag identified by the GP during uh, the remote assessment, and a patient suddenly becoming confused. Uh, so the guidelines clearly states that any difficulty in breathing, uh, persistent pain or heaviness in the chest, sudden onset mental confusion or inability to arouse, SpO2 measured at rest below 96% or less than 94% after mild exertion, if one or more of the features are flagged by the GP or any physician, then they have to be referred for hospital-based management. So do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, why we chose this MCQ is to again show you the importance of continuous management. So during the private sector, uh, uh, Asanka and Sunit, and then uh, did, because it has to be practical, they did a price daily call. Uh, we should encourage our patients, if there is, or the caregiver, if there is any problem, to uh, contact you. Uh, if there is change in the situation, because they don't change in 12 hour intervals, these symptoms. So uh, the, con the ability to be contacted with the following of patients. 
uh, has to be emphasized uh, in keeping with the guidelines. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Let's move on. The last MCQ is on long COVID. Which of the following features are suggestive of long COVID? A, lack of mental clarity. B, nerve pain. C, tinnitus. Parosmia or severe fatigue. So according to uh, the latest published articles, all of these could be a symptom of long COVID. So as uh, mentioned, I think uh, we are still adding to the data uh, and I think the symptoms are keep, they keep getting wider, don't you think so, sir? Like the complaints. Uh, yes, this is the point we want to make because all of this is true. Uh, so there's a, the list is exhaustive. So I suppose every, anything we, be, we have told you the mechanisms which this may cause long COVID. So this is under study still. So please um, don't forget the psychomotor aspects of it. Uh, physical signs and symptoms are easy to deal with, but there's a huge uh, uh, mental health burden which we have still not understood properly, even in our patients. Uh, and also let me add that I think the government sector, there is a long COVID clinic, uh, I think one at the eye hospital by a physician there. And there is a um, uh, test, sorry, smell, Clinic, I think, run at Kalubavida. Sunet, is that correct? Dr. Sunet? Yes, sir. Quite, uh, quite. Is, is the, the smell clinic still on by the ENT people in Kalubavida? Sir, last I checked, uh, they were functioning about uh, two, three weeks ago, but as of the latest, I'm not sure. Yeah, right. So the clinics are there. I'm not too sure about the periphery but I'm sure they also must be uh, having. So the long COVID, there is a clinic run at the eye hospital. So any GP is interested in referring patients who uh, just to get a, uh, a secondary care opinion uh, might be useful in reassuring your patients and carrying on with the other management. Uh, Sunet and Asanka, would you like to add anything? Because we are at the end of our time. No, sir, thank you. Uh, uh, no, sir, nothing. So with that, uh, we would like to thank the SLME and Professor Ishan for sparing his time to very graciously uh, chair and facilitate this session. So thank you very much. And I hope uh, we will equip ourselves to deal uh, with uh, any pandemic uh, which may or we may encounter in the next couple of weeks. It's predicted that we might have a surge. So uh, stay safe and thank you very much to the SLMA and CGS, uh, CGPSL for inviting us to do this present. Thank you and be safe and have a nice day. Yes, and uh, thank you very much to Dr. Hanifa, Dr. Dineshani and Dr. Sunit uh, for their contribution today. Uh, on behalf of the SLMA, I would like to thank all of them. I think it was a uh, discussion on a very important topic. Thank you very much.